Join us today as we travel from Paris to Rome, with our first stop being breakfast at a sandwichery shop. The history of sandwicheries in Paris, France is both rich and intriguing. Mirroring the city's deep culinary traditions and its embrace of simple yet refined gastronomy. Sandwicheries, essentially sandwich shops, have evolved from humble beginnings to become a staple of Parisian food culture, offering a quick, affordable, and delicious option for meals on the go. The concept of the sandwich, as introduced by John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, in the 18th century found its way to Paris during the 19th century, a time when the city was undergoing significant social and economic changes. Parisians, always open to culinary innovations, adopted this convenient food item, incorporating their own flair and ingredients such as baguettes, croissants, and a variety of local cheeses and meats. The first sandwicheries in Paris were often simple street carts or small shops within markets serving freshly made sandwiches to workers and passerby. As the city grew, so did the demand for quick and easy food options, leading to the proliferation of sandwich shops across Paris. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We are at the airport, um, Paris Beauvais Airport, which is actually really far away from Paris. So the drive here is about an hour and 15 minutes. And now we are transferring to Rome. Very excited. We are walking to the airplane. Pretty exciting. Rome, here we come. We're coming! For our short trip from Paris to Rome, we decided to take Europe's low-cost budget airlines called Ryanair. Ryanair is a prominent low-cost carrier based in Dublin, Ireland, renowned for revolutionizing air travel within Europe by making flying affordable for the masses. Founded in 1984 by the Ryan family, the airline started with a modest operation linking Waterford in the southeast of Ireland with London Gatwick. Its business model and operations have since undergone substantial transformations, positioning Ryanair as one of the leading budget airlines in the world. Under the leadership of Michael O'Leary, who took over as CEO in 1994, Ryanair adopted the low-cost business model inspired by Southwest Airlines from the United States. This model focuses on minimizing operational costs to offer low fares while maintaining profitability. Strategies include flying to secondary airports to reduce landing fees, operating a single aircraft type, the Boeing 737, to simplify maintenance and training, and maximizing the utilization of aircraft with quick turnaround times. Ryanair's aggressive cost-cutting measures and focus on point-to-point short-haul flights allowed it to offer significantly lower fares compared to traditional carriers. The airline's growth was further fueled by the liberation of the air transport market in the European Union, which allowed airlines to operate freely across member states. Ryanair seized this opportunity to expand its network across Europe, connecting a wide range of destinations from major cities to regional airports. Ryanair has played a significant role in making air travel more accessible and affordable within Europe, stimulating tourism and economic growth. landed in Rome and are super excited. The first glimpse of Rome was through the window of our taxi, which meandered through the city's veins like a curious river exploring this ancient land. The streets were lined with buildings that stood like sentinels of history, their facades etched with the tales of centuries. The air was a tapestry of aromas, fresh espresso from a nearby cafe, mainly with the earthly scent of cobblestone, warmed by the day's sun.
For this part of our trip, we went to the room in a mansion near the famous Trevi Fountain. It was right in the center of the city, surrounded by bustling shops, restaurants, tourist attractions, and nice little vendors along the side of the road. It was also located directly in front of a bus stop for easy access to other areas of the city. We found that this room was spacious enough to accommodate multiple people comfortably while still having room enough to walk around and enjoy. Overall, the building was very secure and it took us a whopping 45 minutes just to be buzzed in. Of course, that only happened on the first day, so there were no repeat performances of that, thankfully. But once we were inside, there were several locked doors in order for us to get to the main house and then finally to our room. The living room area boasted a grand piano, some artwork and sculptures, authentic traditional Italian furniture, and a space to simply relax and read. We enjoyed this space of the house far more than I thought we would, especially when waiting for transportation, charging phones, and just relaxing before we head out for the day. This space is the main hallway which leads to the exit door. We found that the marble floors added a touch of elegance to the overall decor. This door, however, was massive and I was hesitant as to whether or not I'd even be able to open it. Overall, we were very pleased with our guest house and found it more than enough space to accommodate a family. We also enjoyed the other areas of the house as well. After we were comfortably settled in our room, we decided to do the hop on hop off bus tour to get a feel for the area and see what the major landmarks are that were nearby where we were staying. Our first stop on the hop on hop off bus tour was at the Termini Railway Station. This station was seriously not what I expected. It was overrun with trash and there was a few people laying out on the streets. However, nearby there was a restaurant where people were eating comfortably and they seemed pretty content with the setting. However, this station was not my favorite and I was glad when the bus moved on. Next we saw the Basilica Santa Maria Maggiore. Also on the agenda for this hop on hop off bus tour was the Coliseum Circo Maximo, Piazza Venezia, the Vatican, the Spanish Steps, and Piazza Barberini. So the hop on hop off bus tour lasted about an hour and a half and we got to see all the major stops in Rome. It's an hour and a half if you don't get off. Of course it will be longer if you get off and back on. But we were very pleased with the sights and sounds of Rome seeing all the major landmarks from the comfort of a tour bus and being able to take as many pictures and videos as we wanted with the best views from our seats. Of course, no visit to Rome is complete without seeing the Colosseum. The Colosseum, also known as the Flavian Amphitheater, 
It is an iconic symbol of ancient Rome's grandeur, architectural ingenuity, and complex social structure. It stands as a monumental testament to Roman engineering and entertainment, reflecting the empire's power and the taste of its people. This elliptical amphitheater located in the heart of Rome, Italy, has a history that spans centuries from its inception in glory days to its period of decline and eventually to its status as a revered historic site. After the hop on hop off bus tour, we decided to try some lunch at a local pizza shop. This would be our first time eating pizza in Italy. And what we discovered was that it, it is a very different experience. For starters, the waitress cut the pizza with a pair of scissors, asking me if the size was appropriate enough for what I needed. Once I affirmed that the size was okay, she actually weighed the pizza and charged me by the ounce. Overall, we loved the pizza, but found it very different from what we were used to with American-style pizzerias. That next morning, we decided to try out McDonald's for breakfast just to see what some of the differences are, and boy, were we surprised. This is the McDonald's. Y'all, McDonald's, fresh squeeze in my orange juice over here in Italy. Come on, y'all. Come on with the McDonald's. There it is. This, this, this McDonald's breakfast in Italy, y'all. Come on, y'all. This is a McDonald's breakfast. Breakfast at McDonald's in Italy. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Even price. Dollar. Dollar. One euro. All this stuff. Come on. Come on. Okay, so this might be a tiny thing to some people. But we're at McDonald's. McDonald's. We got some fresh squeezed orange juice and sugar and cheese. We got some Nutella filled and pistachio filled croissants. Fresh squeezed orange juice at McDonald's in Italy. Come to Rome. The Trevi Fountain, known as Fontana de Trevi in Italian, is one of the most iconic and beloved landmarks in Rome, Italy. Standing at approximately 26 meters high and 49 meters wide, it is the largest Baroque fountain in the city and one of the most famous fountains in the world. The fountain's history is deeply intertwined with Rome's ancient water supply system and its development reflects the city's rich history of art, architecture, and the pursuit of beauty. After our visit to the Trevi Fountain, we decided to walk to the Mamertine Prison. So I began my journey from the Trevi Fountain, the symphony of rushing waters immediately envelopes me, setting the stage for an adventure through the heart of Rome. The echo of coins clinking against stones fills the air, a testament to the countless wishes for a return to this eternal city. A cool mist from the fountain brushes against my face, mingling with the sweet scent of gelato tempting me from nearby stands. A perfect start to my exploration of Italian Dolce Vita. Venturing forward, the narrow cobblestone streets of Rome wraps around me, their twists and turns narrating stories of ages past. The vibrant chatter of locals and tourists alike forms a melody around me, a harmonious blend of Italian and a myriad of other languages, each adding their note to the urban course. Shop fronts adorned with leather goods, fashion, and artisanal crafts catch my eye while the enticing aromas of freshly brewed coffee and oven-baked pizza beckon me from the open doors of cafes and trattorias. My path leads me past a succession of historical monuments, each a visual testament to Rome's grandeur and complex history. The column of Marcus Aurelius, the ancient ruins scattered throughout the city, they all bask in the afternoon sun, their ancient stones telling tales of glory and decay. The occasional tolling of the church bells in a distance adds a layer of solemnity to my journey, reminding me of the city's spiritual depth. As I draw near the Mamertine prison, the ambiance shifts, 
The air here is charged with history, the stories of St. Peter and Paul echoing off the ancient stones. The sounds around me become softer and more reflective, as if the very air commands a hushed reverence for the place of deep historical and religious significance. The cool, damp walls of the prison offer a stark contrast to the warmth of the Roman streets, making me feel as though I've stepped through a portal in the past. This walk from the Trevi Fountain to the Mamertine Prison has unfolded the essence of Rome before me, each in a rich tapestry of sights and sounds. So I am standing in the Mamertine prison in Rome, Italy, where the Apostle Paul was in prison and where a good portion of the New Covenant and New Testament was written. And you could just feel the presence in this place. You can feel the Holy Spirit is just permeating this entire room. The Mamertine prison, known in Italian as Carcere Mamertino, is one of the most ancient prisons in Rome, Italy, and holds a significant place in the city's history and Christian tradition. Located in the Forum Romanum, its origins and history stretch back to ancient times, intertwining with the political and religious narratives of Rome. The Mamertine prison dates back to the 7th century BCE though some sources suggest it may have been established in the 6th century BCE by Ancus Marcius, the fourth king of Rome, or even later by Lucius Cornelius Seller in the 1st century BCE. The prison comprises two cells, one atop the other, carved out of solid rock beneath the city's surface. The upper cell, called the Tulanium, is believed to have originally served as a cistern before its conversion into a prison cell. The lower cell, or the actual Mamertine, was accessible only through a hole in the ceiling. The Mamertine prison was not a correctional facility in a modern sense, but rather a holding cell for high-profile prisoners awaiting execution or punishment. It is famously associated with imprisonment of significant historical figures, notably St. Peter and St. Paul, apostles of Yeshua Messiah, who was imprisoned there before their martyrdom. It is here St. Paul wrote, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my physical departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the future there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which Yahweh the righteous judge will award to me on that great day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved and longed for his appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. This association has made the prison a site of Christian pilgrimage. The spread of Christianity and the conversion of the Roman Empire, the Mamertine prison's significance transformed from a site of sorrow and death to one of reverence and pilgrimage. The prison has housed a spring that miraculously appeared to allow St. Peter to baptize his jailers and fellow prisoners. Today, the Mamertine prison is a museum and a sacred Christian site. Visitors can explore the ancient cells and learn about the prison's history and the stories of those who were incarcerated there. The site serves as a tangible link to Rome's complex layers of history, from its ancient political machinations to the profound impact of Christianity.
This is a church that is built over the Mamertine prison. It is a Roman Catholic church called the Church of St. Joseph the Carpenter. It is dedicated to Joseph of Nazareth, the foster father of Yeshua Messiah. So we are standing in ancient Rome in all its glory. In fact, it's, it just looked like it's straight out of the Bible. It really does. It's awesome. And so we are out of time. Definitely have to return. This was awesome. And just like that, we are back at the airport getting ready to head home. Before getting on the airplane, we decided to take another try at Italian pizza at the airport pizzeria.
so this is the pizza that we ended up ordering and all of them were pretty good The one on the end is the margarita pizza, which was the only one with tomato sauce. In the middle, we had pizza with sun-dried tomatoes and spinach, which was quite tasty. And this last one here had french fries actually baked into the pizza, along with fresh basil. That was good as well. This pizza is super fresh. Mm -hmm. Beneath the amber sunset's gentle glow, I stand with my family where history's threads weave, our eyes alight with Rome's eternal show, a tapestry of time we must now leave. The Colosseum whispers tales of might, its stones imbued with echoes of the past, where lions roared and gladiators fought in sight, a memory in our hearts forever cast. We wander through the ruins of the farm, where once the heart of ancient Rome did beat, imagining the hustle, the decorum, now silent, yet its pulse we still could feel. The Trevi fountain in its Baroque splendor, where wishes danced in waters crystal clear, a coin we toss, a promise to remember, to return to Rome, to what we hold dear. Piazza Navona's lively, vibrant scenes, artists painting, musicians softly play. We were captured in the magic, it seems, of Rome's embrace, that in our souls will stay. Now as we turn with hearts to go, the eternal city's beauty and my size, a rivadurci room, I whisper low, a vow to return beneath Italian skies. For now, I carry Rome within my tale, a journey shared, my family's bond so strong, in stories, laughter, love that will not fail, Rome in our hearts where all roads lead, belong.